Hello, welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. I'm really happy today to be having a conversation about a remarkable movie called Nine Days. This movie made a big splash at the Sundance Film Festival in 2020. It is written and directed by Edson Oda, and uh, we have Edson on the show today in conversation with his supervising sound designer, Max Smith, and the re-recording mixer of the film, Brandon Proctor. Nine Days is um, it's kind of a supernatural fable about aspiring souls who go through a really rigorous interview process in order to get chosen for life on Earth. It is uh, a really life-affirming, beautiful movie, and I have to admit, I've seen it several times, and every time I watch it, I am moved to tears. We are really proud to have awarded Nine Days the Dolby Institute Fellowship, uh, and that allowed Edson and his team to have access to Dolby Vision and to Dolby Atmos technology to really uh, take the mesmerizing soundtrack to a whole new level. So uh, before we dive into the conversation with these artists about how they uh, use sound design in really amazing ways to tell this story, I will say we're gonna discuss some sequences in uh, quite a bit of depth. So if you haven't had a chance yet to watch Nine Days, it is in a theater near you right now. So I would encourage you to hit pause on this podcast, go see this movie. This is one of those movies that like, I feel that um, the less you know about it going in, the better. You kind of just need to let it wash over you and to take the ride and have the experience. So please go watch this movie and then come back and listen to Edson and Mac and Brandon talk about how, um, how they use sound design and music and Dolby Atmos technology to, uh, to bring this story to life. Um, so with that spoiler uh, alert, let's dive into this conversation. All right, Edson, Mac, Brandon, thank you guys so much for joining the Dolby Institute podcast to talk about nine days. Um, I was just realizing, uh, you know, we gave this movie the Dolby Institute Fellowship, as you know. Uh, so Sundance actually sent this movie to me now almost two years ago to watch for the first time. It just seems amazing. But I'm so thrilled that Sony, I'm so thrilled that Sony picked the movie up and that they decided to wait until the theaters were open to to release the film. Nine Days is, is such a special movie and it really needs to be enjoyed and experienced in a movie theater, I think. And so I'm really, I'm, I think it's great that they have been waiting and patient uh, until the time is right to bring this movie out. So I'm thrilled to be, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you guys about it. Yeah, happy to be here too. Yeah, me too. So Edson, um, I want to start with you with a, a question about uh, the inspiration behind the film. Uh, I know we've talked in the, in the past, and you said that it was it was uh, kind of inspired by the story of your of your uncle. But how you know how, how did you take this kind of tragic story of your uncle and figure out how to write it as this particular screenplay, and how did it become Nine Days? Yeah, um, just so I can give a little bit more context for people don't know the story but it's just um when it was a you know a kid it was like um uh, 12 at the time and uh, my uncle was 50 and he committed suicide and uh at the time when he did it it was pretty much like i saw him like uh, this figure of failure you know you can't i can't become like him and and uh, it, there was a lot of shame you know uh connected to him and everyone was like oh, yeah there's someone who wasn't like strong enough to survive the world you're living now and and uh, yeah, and, and, and I think for a while, you know, I grew up like feeling like that, uh, having those feelings towards him. And uh, while I was, you know, growing up and going through my own problems and uh, struggles, and I could just start, you know, empathizing with him, him more. I think going through the same problems that I think he possibly went through, not in the same level. I think he went in a very extreme and unbearable way, but uh but I could, you know, uh, relate more with him and empathize more with him and see that, uh, you know, uh, there are parts of him inside myself, you know, and, and, and also explore that kind of fear that I have of becoming him and uh, not wanting to follow his path. And I think from this, you know, uh, thoughts and meditation came this uh, question, like uh, who uh, are there people who are not ready to survive in this world that we live in? It's like, is this world too difficult for these people? And who, 
who we as society we push forward as the people people that kind of you're going to do well in this world you know and i think all this question is start just questioning even my uh um my ideas about my uncle and my i think misconceptions about him and uh in a way that is there such a thing as like living a successful life and is there such a thing as like if you uh finish your life one way that that way would define the way you live you know the whole the whole life so i think nine days was uh pretty much like those questions i think my my i i um uh, more I, I i want to believe so a more mature version of my question in my thoughts when it was like a uh, younger and i think nine days like a result of that yeah well there's so much that i love about the film but one of the things that i was thinking about again as i watched it is you set this up so basically we're we're left with it comes down to kane and emma right and um you set up this question about is Cain the better choice because he is uh, tougher uh, in, in a way um, and less sensitive? And it really, it, it causes you to ask some pretty big questions, as you said, about like who is going to be successful in this life and, and what are the qualities that, that um, enable you to kind of move through life? And one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about that I, I really love about the the film and the, the script specifically is I love those movies that don't spell everything out for you at the very beginning. And I think that Nine Days in particular does a fantastic job of of intriguing you with the premise, but it gives you information very slowly, right? As you And it takes some patience and some work to kind of figure out what's happening in this world and where am I and what 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 is this place and... And I, I just wanted to ask you, Edson, about your the development of the writing process and how did you figure out how to kind of navigate that and give the audience enough information so that we're intrigued and we want to stick around and find out more, but not leave us so far behind that, you know, people could just get frustrated and like, uh, you know, I'm, I don't understand what's happening. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And, uh, and because I, I feel like as a filmmaker, we always want to give enough and not give more than that because if you give more and, and I think I'm not just talking about like storytelling story or anything I think for sound or for like images or anything that you when you're telling a story you want to leave some gaps so the audience can fill those gaps with their imagination I think that's the most powerful you know thing that can happen when someone has you know contact with any piece of art you know or any piece of you know work or any, any anything that they you know see and Okay, now I'm gonna complete this with my assumptions, with my images, with my history, my my imagination. So uh, from from the beginning, I knew that you couldn't be like a, uh, uh, it, it, it couldn't be complete. It, it needs some some kind of gaps. And even when I was writing, I, I didn't have answers for everything. You know, I tried to have answers for uh, uh, most of the things, but there's some areas that I feel like, oh, this is up to the audience to you know, uh, um, interpret like who, who will was or who, you know, what does that mean? You know, but, uh, I, I wanted to give enough, uh, uh, you know, information so they wouldn't get confused because I think confusion then is like, um, you, you just, uh, is, is the audience just like, feel like, Oh, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to watch this because I, I don't know where I am at. So the, the audience needs to know where they are at. But at the same time, they, they can just like walk with their own, you know, uh, uh, feet, uh, and legs. So in, in, in the process was kind of tricky because while even when I was writing the script, uh, I think like it's just sending out and had feedbacks from people so they could just, uh, let me know like, Oh, this, uh, I want to know more about this. This I want to, you know, I think there's enough, but, uh, even with it, when they, they, they complain, like I wanted to know more about this, but sometimes, you want to because, you know, you're just curious, you want to, or you want to because if without that information, you'd be lost. And if it's just because you're curious, that possibly I wouldn't give it to them because I feel like, okay, if you're curious and you just can create your own narrative. And, but if, if it's something that you need to follow the story, so yeah, probably would give. So even after, you know, all this feedbacks that I got uh, uh, from, you know, writing the script, I think after we were just screening the, 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 the cuts to people, 
mostly was just like how confused you are, how much more information you really need, and how if this information is just um, I, I'm spoiling you with information, which I think is not a, a filmmaker shouldn't spoil the audience with information. You should just give what's necessary. But more than that, I prefer not to give. You know, if I can, I think it's for everything that you, the if you can do with the least, I think is better, you know, rather than just overload them with the uh, thing. So it, it was, it was a lot of, you know, conversation with the audience, conversation with us, you know, like the, the whole team in the editing or why are you doing sound or where in, in all the, you know, the, 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 the phases. So we could find this, you know, uh, specific place that we, we want to be. Did you find that during post-production you, there were some elements that were missing or that you kind of had to fill in and did you go back and shoot some more pieces or how did you handle that? We, we didn't shoot more pieces. Uh, uh, I don't know if because of choice or, or because of, uh, we, we, <laughs> I, 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 I like to believe that it was our choice. If you needed something, possibly we would have the chance, but I don't know if so, because I think for independent, you know, film uh, making is not like, you know, you, you can, also, and even for like big budget movies, it's not always you have, you know, the, the, the privilege of be shooting stuff that, you know, miss. But I think what, what I try to do is always like being creative what, with what you have before you just go for, you know, ask your mom and dad to, you know, I, I need some more stuff, but you try to just solve with the stuff they have. And, and it was interesting because when you try to do that, it's so much about like, you know, exercising the creativity in the, uh, to the limit, you know, to a limit, you know, just like try, try, try. And then there's a point say, okay, I need help. And then if you're possibly, okay, you, you go there and shoot something else, but you try to just solve it with, with the, the tools that you have in hands. I, I can't imagine that the, the movie would have been much better had you had more time. It's really, you know, as you say, the, the choices are all very clear and very specific, but it's, it's interesting. I want to follow up on something you just said. And it's, and I'm always curious with a, especially with a first time filmmaker, how did you come to choose Mac and Brandon uh, to be your sound team for the film? Uh, and what was it about them that you sort of responded to? Did you interview other people? Like how was your process for figuring out who you wanted to work with? Um, I think for a sound specifically like Jason, you know, he, he had so many, you know, great things to talk about then. And then I, I, I checked them, you know, their work and watch, you're talking about uh, Jason Michael Berman, your producer, right? Jason Michael Berman, yeah, Jason Michael, yeah, 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 yeah. Jason Michael. But I, I think like everyone knows Jason <laughs> Berman, everyone in the world, but <laughs> because, uh, but uh, that's it's not, yeah, it's not the case, but uh, yeah, but everyone who 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 knows him really knows him, yeah. So, and he, yeah, and, and then I just look at their you know credits and movies they worked on and and watch some other stuff, but mostly the a lot of this stuff I already watched it and it was just a, a big fan, you know, of their, their work. And then they just talking to them about like the, the same, I think it's, it's easy, easy to just identify when you talk to someone, like how they see the movie in the same way they see, not that they need to see the same way. I don't mean like they think like you, you know, but it's more like you're walking towards the same direction. And, uh, even though like we do like different, you know, uh, uh, things and uh, think differently and stuff, but you kind of are on the same page and say, what, what type of movie we're making here? And, uh, and, and, and also like, not just in, in the talking about like work, but also in the way that how personal the project is and how this can be more intimate. And, and that I felt from both of them, like so much, you know, love and, you know, care for, for this project since the, you know, the first day that I met, met with them. And that, that was, that was very uh, uh, um, important to me and very, um, um, it was amazing just to see that from, from them, not just like amazing, you know, in what they do, but also have this kind of love towards the, the film. Brandon, what was your first reaction? Yeah. What was your first reaction when you read the script? Uh, I was just kind of amazed by the idea and the scope of it. I mean, it just kind of, um, I, I was, I was just excited. I mean, literally excited by this, this just loving, touching kind of film that just was, I don't know. Um, 
I, I couldn't wait to see it when it was done. It was that one of those things like, for uh, you know, like how is this going to look when it's done? You know, it, it was such a, I mean, and they, they, it's amazing how they accomplished that because it, it was, you could read it on paper, but then actually, you know, is it going to be intriguing to watch or is this going to be, you know, what's going to be on the screen? You know, I was, I was also a little concerned, like, cause you could almost read it and go like, God, I hope people, this is going to, I hope this works. You know, yeah, is it going to screw up or uh, yeah, <laughs> gonna, you know, who, who, I think it's screw this up. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I, 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 I think that's that true. honestly, like, like, and now knowing Edson, like it, I would have never, you know, doubted Edson before. I just didn't know him yet. I was just, there's just this, this script. And like, this is, this seems so, it seems so complicated, you know, because it had to be so simple and clean and it had to uh, evoke this emotion through the film with, with, even as I was just saying, like with with almost not that many tools, you know, and and the story is is there. This it was so strong, um, and and we had to carry that in sound as well. It had to be that same, like you know, we jumped through so many hoops, and hopefully nobody can tell that. You know, when we're you know we're you know we we're, we're finished it, and it was like complicated and hard, and and now you're you're done, and like, eh, why was that so hard? You know, it, it, it should have that kind of, you know, which is good. I don't want anybody to think, you know, we can talk about it, of course. But, um, yeah, and I was just excited to see it. And when I saw it, I was just already kind of, like, amazing. You know, the the, the acting alone is just phenomenal. How did you decide a house in the desert? And then what did those decisions in terms of challenges for Mac and Brandon, how did you respond to that and sort of building out sonically what the world would be? Why, 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 why the house? Yeah, it's interesting. But I never thought about like specifically why the house, but it, 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 it's almost like the house would represent who will, it, the house is will, you know? So it's just like a person isolated and, and you know, from, from everything else, everything around. So there's just, like he, he is the house. He lives in the house, but he is the house as well. And the desert just, I think, represents, you know, this, um, I, I, I sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm resistant to just give interpretations because then people feel like, oh, this is the, this is the right way to think, you know? So I, I'm just speaking in a way that I'm figuring out right now, you know, I feel like, yeah, maybe it's like this, you know, just, just, it was just this house and he was the house and everything, you know, around them. It's just distant from everything else, and it just there's this emptiness and uh, uh, and 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 also like house was interesting because you can uh, th this was intentional like I I wanted to explore like the house since the, the house represents who he was he was in prison in this place in this place that like for example he everything you see in the movie it's from like the 80s right it's very like a VHS and all this kind of stuff so uh, this represents like the past when he died, he got in prison that period of time. So he died like in the eighties or uh, late eighties or something like that. So everything around him is from that, you know, time. And then there's even parts that are just like, for example, the projection room, you're going to see there's like some, uh, you know, there's a blackboard, or there's like some school desk that represent even like, uh, you can go back a little, even a little bit more. Like it's like his childhood. In the kitchen as well. Yeah, you have a little bit of, you know, this kind of warm feelings. And then you have like the living room. And so, so everything like evoke a little bit of his past about his life. So that, that was pretty much uh, the, the reason of why I chose a, a house and, and the desert. And how did you come up with the, the crazy, brilliant idea of the wall of televisions and at each television? is a soul that Will has placed and he continues watching them as they go through their lives. But would, was that just an image that came to you or how did you come up with that idea of the, te the wall of televisions? Oh, thank you for, thank you for calling it brilliant. I don't know if it's brilliant, but it's, fun <laughs> it's functional. Um, it's functional and very <laughs> visual, <laughs> obviously. And it gave these guys amazing opportunities to work with. Yeah. A lot of work for them. Yeah. I gave a lot of work. <laughs> 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 no, it's not, not well slept, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, it, I think it was, it, it was the, the it, it was because of functionality, you know, it was the only way I found like, for example, okay, after he sent them, what's the way that 
in which way could he just follow them through, you know, their lives? And that I was struggling and, and, and it was like uh, TVs was a good way to go because there's, okay, well, how could he watch? Otherwise, it was just like, okay, I choose someone, but it, you, you don't, if you don't live with the consequences, it's really easy to do whatever you want. So it, you, you need the consequence. So it, with the consequence, your decision, it, 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 the weight of your decision just goes up and goes higher. So uh, what would be like a, a tool so I could just like uh, uh, make the audience and will see the consequence? So yeah, probably like camera. So you need to see it. It's not that people are going to write letters and say like, oh, he's doing well. And he's like, got married. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's not very cinematic. <laughs> so I feel, okay, we need to see it through, or maybe they're going to send videos, but there's something about live, you know, that's kind of uh, interesting, intriguing and magical. So um, there's even, yeah. And, and, and I think like it was, coming from necessity. So every time I was just like, what could, could it be until I feel like, oh, this, this feels like more, you know, cinematic and more at the same time cinematic, but also fun. Yeah. So Mac, you get this, you get this film and it has this wall of, I don't know, what is it like 30 televisions going? And it so is 30 televisions. Yeah. Yeah. So Mac and Brandon, tell me about the challenges of the wall of televisions and how you guys approach this. Uh, Cause obviously you can't like have live sound coming in from 30 televisions all at once. So how did you approach it? It was very intimidating. Um, and it took me a couple of weeks to really kind of wrap my head around it. You know, I, I would sit there in front of a empty pro tool session, like, how am I going to do this? Um, <laughs> but, you know, going back to the spotting session that I had in New York with Edson and Michael, um, yeah, you know, we talked about what are what are some of the different things we could hear on the TV, and Edson kept saying, you know, I I, I want to really evoke everyday life on these televisions. I you know I want to show all kinds of moments. You know, the the good moments, the bad moments, the the um, you know mundane moments of life. Just kind of show everything. And so I said, well, obviously we need to hear you know, sound effects of people doing things that you see on the televisions, but also voices. Um, and then I also brought up the idea of like, you know, what about music? Because people in life are, you know, they're driving in the car and they're listening to the car radio, or maybe they have the music on while they're brushing their teeth or they're, you know, dancing to something. And they said, yeah, we're, you know, we're open to all kinds of ideas. And, um, and then I found out that Linda Cohen, the music supervisor, um, works for five alarm music, which is a, a music service, which has 300,000 tracks. And they suddenly sort of opened the door of that to us. And so suddenly we, we had the option of not just putting sound effects, but music. And then I, I talked about how important loop group was going to be recording all these voice actors. And Edson talked about how the televisions are supposed to be, you know, sort of a slice of the world between North America, Central America, and South America time zone wise. So they're all kind of waking up and going to sleep around the same time. And so we wanted to, without it overtly being said in the film that, oh, these people are from uh, Brazil and these people are from Chile or whatever. Um, we had to have those, those moments of those foreign voices to kind of sell that will have these souls that have, have gone to different parts of, of earth. Um, so loop group was, was really important. And we, we ended up recording over two days in New York with, um, Dan Fink and Bruce Winnett's group. Um, we had one day that was kids and actors who spoke Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese. And then another day with, um, actors of all ages, um, uh, speaking English. And normally for loop group sessions, you know, the, you're having them record to specific, picture like you have a scene in a restaurant in a movie and okay you two are going to be that couple back there and you're going to be the the you know major d telling someone you know come with me to this table this film it was like largely recording just different emotions and different improv we had you know we had a passive of, of like parents like yelling at their kids you know being aggravated or kids going you know being whiny um, like, mom, you know, I can't find my shoes and like, you know, we're going to be late. And to, to, um, the voice actors doing love scenes where they're, you know, romantic and falling in love with each other. Cause we wanted to have all these emotions to pull from, to reflect in the TV's 
kind of what was happening in the room with Will and the, the, the souls. And so it's very subtle, but we had to like figure out like how, where we could place these little bits of music loop group and the sound effects. I wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that was so unusual and weird that it was going to pull someone out. So I really tried to stick with very recognizable everyday sounds like, you know, washing dishes, doors closing, cars starting, um, you know, shopping carts, just, you know, really the things that everybody hears every day, uh, bells ringing from a church, you know, um, announcements, things like that. But then it was really difficult trying to figure out, okay, like, you know, how do we make it so it's not a cacophony that you're selling, that there's all this sound, but how do we do it in a, in an artful way that makes it, gives the impression there are 30, 30 TVs playing at once, but you can't really have sound coming from all those TVs. So Brandon was very instrumental in, in, in helping figure out like, what do we hear when? And, um, and we utilize Atmos a lot for, for the televisions in particular. That, you know, the, so we had to set how we separated ourselves, you know, you normally have like a dialogue machine and effects pro tools and stuff, but we had a dedicated machine just to the TVs. So they were, each TV we had, we would set up for like 10 TVs when there's 30 and all each TV is actually an object with 24 tracks below the head loop group and dialogue and effects and Foley. So we treated each TV kind of like its own little mini film. Um, but it had to represent a real life and not something like you're watching TV. It couldn't sound like a TV show. It had to feel like it was a real life. And uh, so that was difficult. And, and Mac, you know, had that loop group and that music and all those little elements to help those each kind of like mini movies help sell those experiences as a life is actually happening, especially with all that emotionality of the, you know, is it a happy or, you know, you know, you know your kid to go to bed or get in the bath or it's a kid taking a bath, you know, all the things that we know that we're, we're kind of familiar with. And, and so each one of those TVs could actually be moved anywhere in the room. So you'd have 24 tracks, you know, feeding just one basically mono TV that we can then spread or move to the left, or maybe it's higher up in the room because it's stacked on top of the other TVs. And then we could also pan those TVs around together um, as a group, um, which made it complex. But then at the end of it, you're like, it's, it's simple, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then, and then we'd have to, you know, you have to think about foreign markets and how you're going to split out all the dialogue and the foreign dialogue and so forth. So it, it enabled us to do those things in a more, you know, easier fashion. Um, but it really was like, you know, 10 little mini movies kind of happening where we could focus in on the other characters. So the TVs are a character in itself, but then there's all, all the TVs have their own, you know, you know, actors and characters that are actually in the film um, and that we'd have to actually focus uh, in on. And so then we could actually have a sound. And Edson was very you know, instrumental in knowing, like, I need to have this here. I need to, this sound can pull us into this scene so we can then focus into to what's going on in that, that, that screen. Um, it, it, it was a lot of fun, but obviously yeah. very difficult. It, it, you know. it was interesting because I think from, from you guys came the concept of, it was almost like the 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 TVs became my score, you know, for scenes in a way that you you're building, you know, you, you kind of almost like wrote music with the the sounds from the TVs. Like for example, now I need something that's a little bit more emotional. Like it's for example, with Tony Hale's scene, there's I always remember that train just going away when he's just about to you know, explode. And there's some those kind of cues. There was just like a, you, you both are working almost like composers, you know, in that in that scene with like sound effects with like, you know, sound design, which I thought was masterful, the work that you, you guys did. Well, and one thing that, you know, ended up being a little bit of a happy accident, I think is when you shot the film is when we're in Will's office, sometimes you had the door open to the living room with the TVs and sometimes you had it closed. Um, and I don't know if you had any foreshadow, but I remember in that spotting session saying like, Hey, could we have some of the sound of the TVs spilling into the office? And you really hadn't thought about it too much. Um, but that ended up being a great tool that suddenly we could, in the office, you know, you weren't always hearing the TVs, but at certain moments you were hearing the TVs. And, and the one moment that I um, I was talking to Brandon earlier about that um, I kind of went for, and I wasn't sure if you were going to like it or not, Edson, was when Emma comes in 
uh, for the first time, Keo brings her in. She shows up late. She's the last soul to be interviewed. And you don't really see the TVs, but she walks in. And I know the door is open because you see it open later. And I have this uh, track playing like it's from a jazz club. Yeah, like there's that, a yeah. couple yeah. out on a date and you hear yeah. the, the piano player and yeah. the drummer and they're yeah. kind of going That's for right. it. And Keo's introducing her to Will and they're talking and all that stuff. And I, I was kind of like, you know, cringing a little bit like what's what's Edson gonna think and you play it and you're like I kind of like it it's almost like they're on a date together yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was great because they, they yeah it was kind of score. yeah it, it was interesting because it became uh, it, the, all those you know uh, things like just became the score you know like the the music the, yeah and everything it was very 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 great idea for me. and there were some times where you heard like people laughing yeah. in the TVs totally. yeah. when yeah. they're you know, people being interviewed and like, you know, it may, they may be laughing because something is funny in the interview or it might be the opposite. Like somebody's laughing in a serious moment yeah. and it just yeah, gives right. that, that weird sort of yeah. Yeah. emotionality and dimension to it. I love how thoughtful and specific you guys were about this, Mac. I remember when I came to visit you guys at the, at the mix at Skywalker and you were so happy you showed me the map that you guys had made of the house. Can you talk about that and sort of why, why that level of specificity was important for you? Well, it was, it was a map that we got from production of, of, you know, here's the layout of the house. And, and I thought it was really important for us to know the geography well of the house, especially for the TVs, like where, and talking to Edson, like, you know, where, where do we hear the TVs? Where do we not hear the TVs? Like we really talked about when they go back sort of on the garage workshop area, you're you're really not going to hear the TVs there, and the cabinet room. You're probably not going to hear the TVs, but other places it could kind of spill into those zones. And and Brandon, you've talked about the you know it made it complex for the geography, for the mix and the reverbs and all that stuff. To you know where are we in the moment and and how do we sell that? Because the map actually helped. I mean, it was complicated, but the, the idea that like, okay, if you're looking at this door, the TVs are off to our back right. We know that because we have a map of the house. We know exactly where they live, no matter where we're at in the house. Um, and and so that, that obviously helped. And then, of course, each TV has their own reverbs as far as like what's happening in the scene. But then there's the reverb of the TVs. As you get further away from them, there's going to be another kind of reverb that's now, now it's for the TVs in the room instead of actually being the TVs, the reverb in the scene, <laughs> in the TVs. Because each scene is, because each TV is kind of a little scene in itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, we thought of all those things and then we'd break the rules whenever we, we needed to for, to help tell that story a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's. The other wonderful. conversation I had with Brandon early on was like, you know, Normally in, in movies like this where there's a house, you're spending a lot of time in this house. It's like, oh, well, what, what's going on outside? Oh, yeah. There are neighbors. There's, you know, traffic going by. There are birds. There are crickets at night. We had none of those things to use because <laughs> this house is in the middle of nowhere. And um, so it was like, okay, well, what do we make the room tones sound like? And he and I talked about it early on that, like, he, you know, going on on what Edson said about the house's will, will is such a sort of um, t his, there's the weight of the world is on his shoulders because he has to make all these decisions and you see, you know, the way he kind of hunches over that he's, he's a depressed, you know, really challenged individual. It's like, what if we make the room tones sound very heavy and oppressive? And we have all these layers that that way we can also like slowly pull those out in those moments where we need to be really quiet, like in the scene where Mike comes into the office and gets the news from, from Will suddenly that room, which, which sounded a lot fuller is stripped down and really makes the audience like lean way in. Yeah. I love that you brought that up because that scene really stood out to me again, when I watched the film again, you know, when, when Will delivers to Mike the news that he's not going to go any further, that he's done. And, and Edson, I, I, I noticed this time, you know, you, the first shot of that scene is you just cut to it. It's a close up of, of Mike um, and his face. He's sitting at, in Will's office, sitting at the desk and, and he's obviously, he's been crying, but there's just this long space when you're holding on his, on his face. And the Mac, to your point, the room tone is just so, it's so bleak and sad. And immediately you know exactly what's happened and you just leave the space for this 
emotion to be there. But even the room tone in that moment feels like it's almost like a score, like you're using it in that way. I, can you talk about that? Yeah, it, it just goes back to like finding all those those tones that that represent sort of will, and then figuring out like what what to strip out and when. And, and I'm sure Brandon was very instrumental in figuring out which which one was the right one. Um, but the the other rule that we kind of established in the the ambiences in Will's house is we want to keep them all on the screen. I mean, normally in in movies nowadays, we're putting ambiences in the surrounds, you know, with Atmos, maybe putting a little up top. And we felt it very important to just stick it all to the screen. Of course, um, Antonio Pinto's score and the TVs gave this dimensionality, but we really wanted to save, you know, the big Atmos wow spaces for for a little bit later, right after this this moment that we're talking about to really open things up. So I, I think sticking to the screen and then stripping those those layers away is, is was what was really key to give those dynamics and that shape to to those scenes that needed it yeah the the tvs do represent life you know and and so everything with his life we try to keep you know keep two-dimensional you know a little flatter um and then whenever we we could go into any of those tvs or whenever the tvs would move those are they're, they represent life. So that actually we would start using the surrounds and the Atmos speakers, anything we could. And then when, when things did, you know, erupt into this, this kind of, you know, celebration of life, um, then we would just fire everything around us as much as possible. All right. You guys brought it up. Let's dig into that and talk about it. Um, Edson, I, I want to start with you and the kind of the inspiration um, where this idea came from that will gives these last um, these last requests to the souls who don't get to move forward. And he, he, he builds at, he asked them for their favorite experience that they've seen. And then he kind of tries to build it for them so they can have that experience before, you know, before they very beautifully and powerfully disappear. Um, where did that concept come from? I mean, it's, 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 it's beautiful in the way, you know, um, uh, Kyo tells Emma at one point that Will's the only interviewer who does this, but where did that idea come to you? And, and what does it say about Will that he does this? I, I think there's a lot about, uh, I think it's the ultimate demonstration of like small things matter. I think it, it, as much as this is like a cliche and, you know, but it, it's, it, it's a cliche because it, it happens, you know, so it's just like, a, and, um, but, uh, but it's just like demonstration of like a, how, um you know simple can happiness be or i'm not talking about like a, the ultimate happiness like happiness happiness forever but it's just like that moment of joy it can be like super simple so uh, and, and i think it goes like to like moments when i i realized like i was so fulfilled and i felt like so happy and it's, it wasn't it has nothing to do with like winning an award or doing anything that was like super Super, you know, like um, related to any achievement, but it's more like you know when I was with my parents, or when I was with someone I loved, or when I was dancing, or was you know playing ball or something. So I think come from from that um, moment, but also towards like uh, how can I uh, touch it? How can I you know grasp it, but in a way that is also not graspable, you know, because uh, um, it, you you can't leave there that. Or, or something like that. So I think that the experience came from, from that, but also from the necessity of uh, showing Will was someone who cares as well, or someone who, you know, for, 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 um, it was interesting because throughout the movie, we, we had so many moments that people, people got angry at Will because, you know, he's stuff at, at her, his kids, you know, and, and I, I, I say kids because it's almost like he's that parent who, you know, kind of struggle in the, award but he doesn't he just want them to you know learn that the award is not like a, a, a easy place to be in you know so uh but then those i think those moments just show like that actually he, he cares he wants to give them something he wants to you know just uh, uh give a gift of life like to to them so i think it comes from from that place for me so so the first, uh, the first last wishes scene that we, that we see, uh, the first of two, well, I guess three, if you count the very end of the film, um, 
is, is, um, Mike, uh, whose wish is to go to the beach. Um, so Mac and Brandon, you guys were still fairly early on in the sound post-production process when you found out that you were going to get the Dolby Institute fellowship and that was going to allow you to mix in Atmos. So what kind of light bulbs went off for you in terms of these specific, you know, last request enactment scenes and how did you then approach this first one with Mike? Uh, cause it's just a magical scene. I remember being in a theater the first time I saw it with an audience and it was just a beautiful moment. Yeah, we approached it in kind of a way of just, um, first of all, you know, how small we can start it, how, how a little bit like even as it was like, I want to feel every grain of sand. I want to hear every grain of sand as we get into this. I want to feel every little moment. And so Brandon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, I'm going to stop you right there for one second. Cause I just want to say, I don't know that I've ever been moved to tears by a Foley cue before, but, and maybe I'm <laughs> presuming, good. I'm presuming it was Foley. Maybe it was production, but that moment when Mike yeah. like kicks off, yeah. when, when Mike kicks off his shoes and he puts his foot in the sand, like I just started to weep. It was so beautiful. I have to give credit to John Resch, our Foley artist on this movie who's worked on a thousand films, you know, from E.T. and Back to the Future through, uh, you know, Christopher Nolan and and Fincher, you name it. Um, he did such a beautiful job. Jason Butler did the Foley mixing and Jonathan Stevens was our Foley editor. So they were a fantastic team together. And I, um, I sent uh, John a message when we were in that reel after it had been mixed to come over to uh, meet Edson for the first time and we had that moment up and so John got to hear it and he you could see him get a little teary-eyed too hearing it he was so moved and I, Edson I don't know if you remember this but but he he took you aside kind of you know stopped and said you know I've worked on so many films and you have something really special here. Yeah. He, he, no, he, I remember I rolled down. Kind of, uh, <laughs> and he was being, yeah, he was, was being totally like, honest. He was, he was like, uh, this, yeah, you have lot, something yeah. here. This movie is really yeah. beautiful yeah, and amazing. Yeah. That so it's this, in a lot of ways, this movie, like every single department from writing to acting, the cinematography, everybody was moving, you know, firing at all cylinders. And I, and it made us want to do so much better ourselves. Like just everything was inspiring everything. And so it was such, such wonderful. And, and that my, that mic moment, it was nice that Edson saved for us to be um, sound design only knowing that the one later was going to be more music driven. Um, but they're both very powerful and, and really utilized Atmos in a special way. So Brandon, I interrupted you, but you were saying you, st you were saying you start, you start small. I mean, literally, like you couldn't start smaller, right? A grain of of sand, you know. You wanted to feel, yeah, you know, like that that, and we know that that feeling of your feet in sand. I mean, it, it is kind of a magical thing, anyways, right? And and it does kind of like it's all these 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 little you know moments. They they are just this. They are visceral because you we can and that that thing that Edson talks about how um, to fill in the gaps you know, of, of our own life to, to put into the film. I mean, it's, it's beautiful because you do that. You know, you're, you're like, yeah, you 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 think of the moment you step foot on uh, in the sand, you know, my two-year-old is in love with sand. He, he wants to, we were just on a beach a week ago and he just took his shoes off and put his feet in the sand. 
I mean, that it starts so young, like it's, it's amazing. So we got to start with that one little moment of sand and build it to this amazing, just, you know, to, it, it almost becomes overwhelming and then it's, it's, it's pulled, it's pulled away, you know? And, um, you know, and, and then like, literally like the reverb we use on his voice is actually a warehouse. Like we're in a warehouse that kind of breaks the spell of this, you know, real place. We, you know, we almost feel like we're there, you know, and the, the birds are flying over us in the atmos and there's just, just everything we can do to kind of enrich the experience. Like you can close your eyes and feel like you're there. We were trying to do, you know, with sound. And uh, it was, it was, I mean, Super fun, and we did experiment a little bit because they're they're sort of the 1980s style Walkman headphones of like, okay, are there moments that we want to hear it like it's coming through the headphones or bigger than reality? And and that was a tricky thing that that we kind of went back and forth a little bit on to figure out, you know, does do we want some of that? Do we not want that? Do we want just a little bit of that at times? Which I think we did end up with a little bit at the end at the end there there's a flavor of it in there yeah it's such an intricately constructed scene and you know mac you 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 invoked randy tom earlier and it, it made me think about you know one of the things that randy uh loves to say is that you know sound design becomes very powerful when it gives the audience the subjective experience of the character you know when we're literally hearing through the character's ears what they are hearing and what they're experiencing that's when sound becomes a really powerful narrative device. And I love how the three of you used that idea in this particular sequence of like, it's a fake thing. You know, there's, it's all artifice. There's nothing really, you know, they're, they're in the space and it's a projection screen, but you make the sound very naturalistic and immersive of this experience. And so we believe the experience that Mike is having. And to your point, Brandon, then when it gets taken away, it's just crushing. I loved it. Just amazing. Yeah. 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 Pun intended or? Yeah. Really crush, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it is beautiful. And, and, you know, uh, uh, and the, the ones with An Antonio's score as well, I mean, are just, yeah. you know the are also just the emotionality that the the i mean now knowing antonio like in his his he's such a, a, a passionate he's an expressive guy yeah. Yeah. oh yes oh very you know, yeah. which, we which, love antonio if even, yeah. even for brazilians is 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 very passionate yeah because brazilians are already expensive you know and yeah. like but even for the the, the brazilian standard it's very you know Fashion. Well, <laughs> Mac was joking that he started in the back of the of the room, and as the mix, he was there during the mix, and as yep. he we were going to the mix, he would just slowly he was getting closer and closer to it. Basically, he's like kind he's of on, on the board my lap, with you. You know, yeah. <laughs> he's on the board. <laughs> just, yeah, like, we have and he's we have just, pictures of that. Yeah. He's like he basically giving me massages. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, Brad, oh, this is so you know. But that was that evolved over like uh, over yeah, like ten yeah. days of him like yeah. being in the back, like, "Hey, Brandon, can you do yeah. such and such?" To like two yeah. days later, he's like a row closer, and then he's back, you know, right at the edit suite, and then he's like right with Brandon. Okay, yeah. let's get in this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Antonio, like Antonio is chair, yeah. really. Like just, and, you know, Antonio you know. is my boss. I, I'm, I'm like uh, my my job is to please Antonio. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, no, I'm talking in a way like I feel happy, you know, when I'm pleasing Antonio. Oh, he said, yeah, okay, oh, that's good. That's that's a good sign. So, <laughs> just to to uh, finish that the the thought, like and Antonio, we, we joke about, about him, but he's just like he, he, we had this kind of you know joke, like and say like yeah, Antonio did that, but he's a genius, right? He's a genius. He can do like it's just like <laughs> there's this kind of we're in the editing room and it's like yeah, there, he's a genius. Yeah, that's 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 okay. But but said that we joke about about that, but he's just like so professional and passionate. And and for me, it was like um, I grew up. Uh, listening to his scores in in Brazil, like movies like you know Center Station, um, City of God, we even worked with Michael Mann and Collateral, and uh, he he he's a legend in Brazil. So for me, it was just like oh, if one day I can just work with this guy, and uh, and and then I felt I felt like it was pretty distant because it was like my first feature, but I knew 
uh, one person who worked with him, uh, it was a friend of mine who used to work in the same advertising agency. And then I asked, yeah, why don't you just, you know, um, can you send the script or in, into, you know, to him? And he really loved the script. And then uh, we, we started, you know, like the conversation. And then when, when he watched the movie, then he was just like in love with, uh, with um, everything about it. It was so super exciting. It was just like super, super passionate. And he started having our conversations. And uh, uh, it, was, it was interesting because uh, actually most of the, the, the heavy work, like in terms of uh, uh, the themes, the violin songs, we actually, he actually composed them. Uh, we have versions of them before we start shooting. Because since we kind of dividing, like um, we had to do the POV uh, unit, and the POV was pretty much like during pre-production. And during the POV, that's when like they're playing the, uh, we're playing, seeing the, the, the girl playing the violin, right? So I need the song prior to when I would shoot the movie because uh, I, I would need to, you know, the, the person playing. I hadn't thought about because that. Because then you, you, yeah. you have some. But yeah. uh, uh, the music that Amanda plays becomes, it becomes part of the score. So you had to have Become, all of that stuff It becomes stuff kind before. of the, the theme. Yeah. Yeah. It became, it became the theme. <laughs> and so, so, yeah, I composed this. And then we start just, you know, going through like some conversation. And in the end, it was like, okay, we did this, but not necessarily this will be the, um, you know, the, 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 the theme of the movie, you know, but, but uh, I don't know. It was just like when, when you start using the, our edits and it start just like making sense, you know, that, that song they're composing pre-production became the, 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 this, you know, the, the score, which is very impressive because we just had so, f- not not many days, you know, to do it. So like, yeah, I think he had like two, three weeks or something. And then just, yeah, let's do it. Because uh, we initially producer said, yeah, can't we cheat someone playing the violin and we compose later? <laughs> yeah, I think it's not going to work out. Man. It's just, <laughs> just going to be, yeah, it's going to be. But uh, yeah, he composed something that's so powerful that then we just like start just working with that piece as the, the motif for the rest of the movie, which is, is pretty impressive. And Brandon, how did you did this, this, this score is beautiful and it's all, but it's also big. It's a, it's a very expressive yeah. score. How did you manage to like yeah, work yeah. this into all the other stuff that was happening in the film sonically? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's, uh, I mean, that, that it's, it's age is gorgeous. I mean, it, it kind of was a gift. It was kind of like this, this is, and, and at times it's sparse too. There's only sometimes very little you know, instrumentation, you know, and of course, I had all the stems and so forth. But uh, it was, and Antonio was just like, "You want to let's use the whole room? Let's pull it back. Let's, you know." He was so excited by Atmos and what we could do with it and stuff. And uh, at times, he'd be like, "Okay, let's." Had he worked in Atmos before? I, I don't know if he had. Yeah. Probably. I mean, I, I, I kind of assumed he had, but you know, he he's like normally I'm staring, but you know, like he just he just was so excited by by it and and what he could do with it and what we could do with it. And, and um it was exciting it was actually you know it was also hard at times having the composer in the room the whole time you know you're like okay but but we're trying to sell this no 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 it has to be this <laughs> and at that, that time i would just leave the the room and just oh yeah i just gotta eat some snack well antonio's yeah. very shy he never says what he what he thinks no, he never <laughs> really, really, really. Uh, but um I mean, yeah, it was it was just you know how big we can make it, you know, for the scene as possible. I mean, it, it really was. We weren't shy with it at all. You know, it was it was very much there, and it was you know, I mean, at times, you know, when especially we're in this like you know kind of gray, dark, ambience kind of world, and then to have the score take over, it just had so much life and so much rich you know, feeling that it really could just take the scene and, and go with it. Yeah. Can I just add something like I, we, our, our producer, Jason Berman, there's like some moments with just like, can you go louder? And can you go louder? And there's some moments, can we go louder? And it's just like, we couldn't do it to hear it, so. it's just like, we start going louder and louder. Like for, there's this moment when just, uh, we was just running, you know, to get Emma and it's just like, everyone is just, that's, that was the moment. And they said, yeah, I think it's, it can go down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had, I had to like, yeah. go like, I think 
if we're loud enough right now. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, loud, it can yeah. be loud. It can, it can be loud. Yeah. It can be loud. Like, I, I, yeah. mean, I don't know. Like, it's but that that was kind of my Rocky Balboa moment. You know, it felt like I'm a huge, totally. you know, sport movie fan and Rocky and stuff. That was the moment that needs to, you know, bump them people. Go get her. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think in that sense, Jason was, was <laughs> yeah, was right. Well, since you guys brought up that last sequence, I, I love it. But it's, it's you know, the whole movie is building to this kind of s- such a emotional climax, which is Will decides to, you know, give the, the, the soliloquy uh, that he had talked about earlier, um, which is, uh, which is uh, from the Walt Whitman piece, which is just so lovely. And the performance is so amazing in that moment. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, this is just, it's, 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 Will talking in the desert, but it's not just, it's talk to me about how you treated the sound of his dialogue in that space and what you did with it, because it it's, it's ethereal and gorgeous and the performance is so resonant. Um, it's not just, you know, it's not dry. So Brandon, tell, tell me about mixing that particular sequence. Well, you know, we had all the amazing ambiences and winds that Mac had, had cut for us there. And then, you know, and, and the music pushing him, you know, to that moment to where he could actually have his moment to 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 kind of give her 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 gift that she was going to have from him. And, um, and and then it was it's really it's just kind of the stay out of the way. I mean, he was so amazing. Wasn't it? It was just, you know, just I, I have like. Like it gives me tingles just thinking about it now. You know, um, his his performance is so so amazing. So so from the music to the, to him, I was like, just stay out of the way and let him do his thing. Um, and and like literally the very last sound is him. Like we 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 take the ambience and everything down to just a, a mono situation, and it's his breath that basically leaves us with the film. You know, it's the very last sound we hear is his, which also, you know, it's kind of that grain of sand again. You know what I mean? We kind of, you know, end there where it's just that that little bit of breath and there's nothing. We had every ambience, every single sound was out of the film at that point. And it was only him that we had in that that moment. Um, and, and, it, and it is because it was the most powerful, important aspect of that of that of that scene, you know. Um, it really was, in a, you know, and it, it, it it's, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that. It just, you know, it's so interesting you say that, Brandon, because, because for me, that was the scene also that, that saying that you kind of just let it be, you know, and for me, it was the scene that I, I least directed. I was just let, I say like, yeah, this is it. And I, I just gave up one or two adjustments in the beginning. And then I just told my cinematographer, just follow them. And, uh, and, and Winston's as you do your thing, you know, and they gave, I think one direction, which was like, you, you can't touch each other. And then it was just like, yeah, go, go for it. So it was a scene that at least directed. And it's interesting that you're saying that you, it, it was more like you letting will be who will was, you know, even with sound. So it's interesting. It's yeah. It's one of those scenes that almost tells you just from a gut perspective of like what to do sound wise. Cause it, it just like it's all about, you know, carrying the emotion and not, not getting in the way and finding those moments where the, the wind is there and then the wind starts to go away. And, and, and the other great moment is, is his scream. And then Antonio's yeah. violin yeah. coming out Just of the coming, screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. such a, such yeah. a beautiful a moment. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, uh, I just want to wrap up with uh, one final question for each of you. I think, you know, I've watched this movie now several times since the first time we saw it uh, a while back. And and it just strikes me every time. Like, I cry every time I see this film. And I remember, remember, being, I remember being in the audience with, at the Sundance premiere and just people couldn't talk afterwards. Like, people were just so affected by the film. And it's, it's interesting, like, looking at it again, I realized that, you know, we're all – dealing with our own lives and sort of whatever it is that we're dealing with. And we're all on the hamster wheel and dealing with, you know, whatever the pain and disappointments and, and things, but you, you watch this film and you're introduced to these souls who they want so badly to live. They want this life so badly to exist. And then, and then you experience their pain when they don't get to move forward. And so I'm curious, like 
for each of you, what's the effect of this film been on you? Like, how has it changed your approach to life and, and how you live? Just a little light question to end on. Yeah. Yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's made me just appreciate all the little moments with my family. Um, just the simple things, you know, just, um, you know, being in the backyard with, with my daughter or, um, yeah, just, just those realizing that time, you know, moves a lot faster than you think it does. You know, I've, I've also had a number of friends pass away over the last couple of years and it, and it makes you think about like, yeah, don't, don't waste any day that we have here. Cause it's, it's such a beautiful gift that we have. Um, yeah, just appreci appreciating the people you love, appreciate the simple little things, you know, your first cup of coffee in the morning, you know, all, all those little, little I, details. I, I love that you say that. Cause it reminds me of just, it, it reminds me of what Emma does, which is just notes every experience that makes her happy, you know? Yeah. I, I have to agree. It's the same kind of thing. And it's, it's so interesting having that and then having this, you know, COVID experience kind of thing where, you know, we're, we've been at home a little more and, and I think than maybe what we're used to. And, and it has helped me think about focus and, and focusing on those small details. You, Mac, you said coffee, like, yeah, having a cup of coffee in the morning, like, and how can you make that special? How can you make each little moment special, you know, and, and remember each little moment? Um, and yeah, I have a, I have a two year old, he's about to be three and having, you know, how to have that memory of these times with him and, and how important those, those times are. And it is the most, like it's laying on the carpet with him, you know, and reaching over and, and making him laugh, you know, and it's, it's nothing else, but just me laying on the carpet and, and tickling him and his reaction. And, and it's, it's awesome. I mean, and every little thing like, you know, and, and that cup of coffee or seeing a friend or, you know, being excited to, I mean, what a gift to work on this film, Edson, um, to be able to get it. Uh, you know, it was exciting to go to work and work on a film and then get excited that it would make you excited to go home and, and see your family. You know what I mean? And, and like, just to have that, like, how is, how can you make every moment exciting and, and special, you know? And I think that that's, that's, I think, I think a lot of people are going to get that. And I think because of what the world has gone through right now and, and then getting to watch a film and actually realize it a little more, I think this film is really going to touch people. Yeah, I, I do. I do too. You know, Edson, we're all here because of you. You're the, you're the reason we all took this journey. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, how uh, this, yeah, that's the, so how has, how has this film oh, changed yeah. you writing and making this film? And uh, when you make, when you have this goal, like I'm going to make a movie. And then after it, it's almost like a, that's it. You made a movie, you made your first, you know, feature. And so, but it, it's interesting just to figure out that things don't change that way, you know? But uh, I think perception can change, but I think things themselves, they don't change. But something that I, you know, I take from the movie is just like, I, I'm, I go through a lot of turbulence sometimes and, and I'm a very sensitive person. And I think, you know, what my uncle have, had, you know, I, there's part of that in me, you know, and, and I know that there are some moments that things are going to go well and things, moments that things are, are not, you know, and, and uh, I'm aware of that. So there's even Will, you know, in the end, he, okay, he had this, such a cathartic, amazing moment, but I don't see him in the end after that he, he lived a happy life or something like that. But he's still, there, there's still, yeah, there's still, I, I think he still will go through pain. He chose that path. He, he chose like, okay, I, I'm going to still be alive. I'm gonna, I, 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 I have no fear now of just going back and, and uh, be alive somehow. So he will go through some joy and go through some pain. And for me, uh, um, I, I think, Making a film, movie, and having an amazing experience doesn't uh, doesn't change my life in a way. Like I'm still gonna go through so many difficult moments, and where with that. But I think now, when I when I go through a, a a moment of joy, I won't take for granted the way I used to. You know, I I I, I know I go gonna gonna go through both of them through the rest of my life. But when I go through joy, I'm gonna be able to I think appreciate more. And see, like, oh, this moment is special because I know moments when I, I'm not feeling this way. 
and I'm feeling the way now we're going to celebrate. Now I'm going to enjoy and I'm going to be here in this moment. And, uh, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to take for granted. So I think that's, that's what I got from, from making this movie. That's amazing. Well, um, it's the, it's, it, we're, we're at the end of a, of a long road of, of making this film and getting to this point. And, um, I, I just want to say, you know, from the Dolby Institute and giving it the fellowship, like we're so proud of this film and we're so proud of the work that, that you all did on it. It's just a, it's a, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary film. And we're very proud to have been a, a had a tiny part to play in it and to, to support you Edson and bringing this amazing vision to the screen. So thank you for taking the time today yeah, to talk to us about all. it. Yeah. It's like, a, yeah. Yeah, that, that was great. That was really nice. Was thank you, Glenn. To, to you yeah. all. Yeah, thank and you. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank it's, you. It's awesome. My pleasure. My pleasure. Edson, Brandon, Mac, thanks so much. It was great to talk to you today and have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. I'd like to thank once again Edson Oda, Max Smith, and Brandon Proctor for joining us for today's conversation about Nine Days. This movie is in theaters near you right now. It is released by Sony Pictures Classics, and it is worth going to see in a movie theater. We will have links for you in the show notes for more information about the film. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have a ton of exciting episodes coming up in the next few weeks that you will not want to miss. Remember, you can always find links to the dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you find your podcasts. And while you are there, please consider leaving us a rating or a review on the Apple Podcast app. It really helps raise awareness of the show so that we can continue to grow. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been the Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines. Thank you for listening.